Well, I was a radio operator gunner on a B-17 uh, in 8th Air Force in England. I enlisted initially to go into pilot training. There was initially something in the order of 350 of us who were also in pilot training. We took some basic training. And at the close of this, there was a decision made that they, at that point in war, they only needed about 50 of these 350. And the rest of us went to other things, whatever it was. And I happened to go to radio operator school. There were several opportunities for other things as well, but uh, uh, I had the capability of doing so, and I thought this might work out. Well, first of all, I was in college at the time I went into the service. I had been away to college for just about a little over two and a half years, about two years and nine months, as a matter of fact. So uh, being away from, quote, my personal home was not a, a big difference other than the fact that I'm now all of a sudden in uniform rather than in school. Well, they were not particularly opposed to it. First of all, I'm a member of a large family. I had five brothers and three sisters. There were five of us boys out of the six that were in service during World War II at the same time. So at the time I enlisted, I already had three uh, uh, brothers in the service. So uh, my mother, I guess, and family were kind of accustomed to the boys uh, being on their own. I having had uh, three brothers in the service, two of whom uh, had left with the National Guard before we were actually uh, entered into the war. Uh, it was not particularly a, a new ground for me. I had some familiarity as a result of uh, visiting and talking with my brothers. I was at Keesler Field in, in uh, Mississippi, and uh, you got tossed in largely with persons who were out of college as well. The individuals who made up the component that I was in, the first 220 uh, squadron that I was in, uh, were from Tennessee, from University of Tennessee, University of Alabama, University of Mississippi, and the like. So mostly individuals from colleges uh, throughout the Southeast that came into service just as I did, who had not yet completed their education. I was in college, and uh, I recall vividly uh, uh, in fact, the vice president of the college making the announcement just at noon uh, on Sunday about the the, uh, the bombing that occurred. Individuals at the school in general were a little baffled, among other things. Well, having been, this was the cadets now uh, who probably have as tough a training as most anyone. So I was in Biloxi, Mississippi. And uh, it's a little bit warm down that way. <laughs> and uh, so we were up early and stayed late. I went from there to Knoxville, Tennessee, <clears throat> to the University of Tennessee at Knoxville with other cadet candidates. And we were in training there as well. We did, in fact, among other things, have some flight training but uh, uh, at the completion of that, then we went to classification center and this one, that's when we were dispersed to whatever. Went to uh, Scottfield, Illinois to radio operator school for uh, three or four months. And from there out to Yuma, Arizona in the desert for gunnery training, flight training, then eventually we crewed up with other crews. Now this is a single. We then crewed up with other individuals having gone to Lincoln, Nebraska to do so and went out to uh, South Dakota for flight training before going overseas. After you complete your flight training, you were assigned 
we just knew that we were going overseas. We're not certain whether it was going to be uh, to England or to Italy, because both of whom used B-17s, and we trained in B-17s. So we were pretty certain that we'd go to one or the other. Arrived in the fall of the year, so it was cooling down. It was not bitterly cold otherwise in England, but it was cool, and uh, and you it was full, you were full of anticipation to know where you were going to go and what you were going to do specifically. But uh, then they took all new crews and <clears throat> and uh, assigned a. a individual who had already been flying missions over there and we did some training there to get accustomed to what it was like to get in and out of there so we did uh, several uh, uh, training missions in, in England itself before we began to fly our combat missions. So being new uh, I was a radio operator gunner and we most often, in B-17s, uh, first of all, the 8th Air Force was comprised of three major divisions. 1st Division, 2nd Division, and 3rd Division. I was in the 1st, or we were in the 1st Division. The 2nd Division was comprised of B-24s. The 1st and 3rd Division were all B-17s. So uh, we flew... B-17s could achieve just a little higher altitude than could the B-24s. So we generally flew some missions that they were not able or did not go because it was more dangerous, if you will, to fly at, high, at lower altitude than at high. So uh, we usually took on those. But uh, there's always been a little debate about that, of course. But we know the difference. I remember on a, the first mission that I flew, first of all, you got up in the early morning, anywhere from 2 to 5 o'clock most often. And you went from there to Chow Hall, you went from there down to the flight line where you gathered your gear, and secondly, uh, you, you had a briefing. There was a general crew briefing, and then there were separate briefings for the uh, for the pilots, navigator, and radio operator in separate. And you were able to get your codes that were used for the day because codes were changed every six hours uh, that you were used to send messages and otherwise, uh, and whatever. You went down to the flight line, and boarded your aircraft at whatever time, depending on what the what the weather was like over Europe. Sometimes you sat on the sideline for a good long while in a in a cruise tent down there, waiting until you got clearance to take off. But on our first mission, as we were forming, because you did fly up to anywhere from ten to twenty thousand feet in the air and circled to form up with your group to head out overseas. Uh, there was two planes that collided and went spinning down in a, in a spiral of fire. And I thought to myself, my gosh, am I going to get killed before I get across the water the first time? So, yeah, the first mission I remember vividly. We had been real fortunate for the most part, although uh, we did get clobbered clobbered meaning uh, uh, lots and lots of flak. Sometimes you, there were generally about three types of flak that you would see. Some was a big burst of gray, white like flak. Other was a, what we considered, what we uh, named as halo flak because when the burst occurred, there was a perfect ring of smoke, black smoke around it that you could see, well, of course, yards, obviously. And the third was just a little more mild kind of flak. So there were two or three different sort of flak. And when you were able to see it above you and below you, you felt reasonably good because it wasn't bouncing off your aircraft. But you knew the third time that 
flight was going to come zero in on you because the gunners on the ground were getting that range of those planes. And they were shooting up here, they were shooting down here and here. Now the radio operator had, among other things, had the obligation to throw out chaff. And I know that probably doesn't have much meaning to many people, but chaff was thin strips of tinfoil. It was bundled. And I had a chute right by my radio uh, uh, room that I could shove that in and go out. And when it did so, it sprinkled all over the air like so and messed up the radar of the German guns on the floor, on the ground. So yeah, when we got into it, I was throwing, I was tossing out a lot of <laughs> chaff <laughs> and glad to have it. There were several occasions when things got real tough. Uh, uh, on one occasion, we thought we were going to have, we we lost essentially lost two engines on a off the target or coming off a target, and we began to toss out gear because we didn't know whether we were going to be able to make it back to across to England or not across the channel, and we tossed out a lot of the gear that we had in the plane to make it lighter. So we landed uh, in England. At the end of the runway, thank God, the engines had held. But we lost another engine, and we could we could not taxi, so they had to come out and pull us in. And uh, so there were a couple of occasions when we had incidents of this sort. In addition to that, now after flying a regular tour of missions, I did fly with other crews because when I when my crew our crew was stood down. There were crews that had members of their crew that had been wounded or killed and were not able to get up. So what they did was to pick up persons to fit that bill from other crews that were not flying that day. And I flew with, my crew was Jordan. Now Jordan was, a, was our pilot. Hanson's crew was one of the crews that I described. They had three members on it that had been uh, wounded or killed. One of them was radio operator, one a co-pilot, and the uh, other a waste gunner. And so they picked me up on two occasions to fly with Hanson's crew when my crew was stood down. I was up to fly the third time with them, not, in, not every day now, I don't mean it, but over a period of probably about three weeks. On the third occasion, my crew had been stood down because we had been flying uh, the day before. They put my crew back up to fly, so I did not fly with Hanson. They picked up three members from a new crew that had just arrived in England, and they happened to be flying just off to my left and uh, in a wing down below us. We were a high flight lead, and I could see this. They got a shell right in the midst of the Bombay, and you could see the smoking like you just absolutely wouldn't believe. And I kept saying under my breath, bail out, bail out, bail out. And of course, I was talking to myself, but I was talking to individuals across the way as well, because I could see them just a, a few yards away over there. Tail gunner folded up and came out the waste uh, place one first, and I began to count the crew members, and they came out, they came out, and actually the pilot did come out last, but as he did so, the plane peeled off like so and burst into flames, uh, I'm sure no more than, didn't seem like more than 100 feet, but it was probably 100 yards from where the pilot had bailed out. So it, they were real fortunate, although all of them did, in fact, get out of that aircraft. But I was pretty fortunate that I wasn't up there flying with them that day, too. <laughs> so I'd been scheduled to fly earlier. Although going all the way into Dresden, and that may not mean a great deal to you, was a long, long flight, uh, 13 plus hours that you were in the air. Dresden is all the way in near the Polish border. Uh, it was probably, well, in fact, it was as long a target as we'd ever flown, the longest we'd ever flown. 
uh, it was getting fairly close to the, toward, toward the end of the war. But Hitler wouldn't give up, so we bummed them out over there. They estimated he killed over 100,000 uh, on that particular day. So yeah, I, that was a memorable one because it was tiring. I guarantee you, you were worn completely out. The other occasion that was <clears throat> was memorable was February 3rd, 1945. Although I flew to Berlin more than once, this was a Sunday. We hit Berlin, and the air was full of 8th Air Force aircraft, just as far as you could see in front and as far as you could see behind you. For an hour at a time, it was nothing but a solid line of planes. And we, our particular group, hit there just at 12 noon, and you could see people coming out of church and otherwise, because it was clear as a bell. Although we were up about 28, 27, 28,000 feet, you could look down and see them coming out. And we bombed them. It was Sunday. So, yeah, I remember it very vividly. And uh, although we did not get clobbered with uh, uh, some of the aircraft coming up, I mean, my particular group did not. There were a fair number of planes lost uh, because of that. Uh, they always defended Berlin. Leipzig and a couple of these places fiercely. Going to Berlin or, or to, to, to Dresden wasn't too bad, but when you got shot up pretty bad, and we did get shot up on, on several occasions. Uh, one, one of those occasions when I flew with Hanson crew, we had flown two missions that were long missions. That is anywhere from 10 to 11 hours in the air. And I know that doesn't sound like much, perhaps, to you, but in preparation for that, if you stay on oxygen for six or seven hours, now you believe me, it tires you to, uh, out considerably. And secondly, to uh, accommodate to 10 or 12 hours of flying, you spent several hours in preparation before you left. Your child, you didn't have... You didn't have food to eat up there for that 10 or 12 hours. And secondly, when you got back, you had to unload and clean all your gear, go down to briefing and do a lot of other things before you ever got to the chow hall. So, you know, all of a sudden you spent 14, 15 hours at the very least. So, yeah, there were occasions when we, we did that and it was enough. The third day we went to briefing, and uh, they said, uh, rather than one of the long missions, which I had just described, we were going, uh, good Lord, Essen, I couldn't think of the name for a minute, which is in the upper Ruhr Valley. And we said, great, it's only about a six, six and a half hour flight. Boy, we'd be there and back in a hurry. They, they uh, briefed us as, Fairly, fairly light gun coverage. Well, unfortunately, Germans had moved barges of guns up that Rhine River in the night or before, since the data had been collected. And when we went in over that target, they estimated 890 guns on us. So you can believe the sky was full of flak. We got our fair share of it. Uh, we lost two engines uh, before we got out of there. While the flight was lost, I never cheered about another one, <laughs> I can assure you. So that was one of the tougher ones, and I've lost contact with many. Uh, Bob was our pilot who was from Birmingham, Alabama, as a matter of fact, but he came back and was killed in a hunting accident in 1947, I guess it was late 46. And he was married, had children. Uh, his wife had gotten in touch and so on. So some of the crew attended there. Uh, the co-pilot later became a first pilot uh, and, in fact, completed a tour uh, of 25 years or 30 years in the service. Uh, and... Uh, 
and I met with him on several occasions. He just died a little more than a year ago. We've gotten together, and I, as part of our full first bum group, we've gotten together at, uh, every two years for years. And so I made it, maintained contact with him. One of the individuals who I was close to uh, went out to, well, after, after coming out of service, he in fact was a waste gunner, but went out to Denver, Colorado <clears throat> and worked with Air, Frontier Airlines. Well, he worked with Western initially and then Frontier. I did visit with him on a couple of occasions. Lost contact, I ran into one additional crew member uh, in Ohio some years ago. And those are really the only two crew members I ever maintained that much contact with. The second crew I flew with, I did have contact with a couple of people from there. I came back in, night, in July of 1945. <clears throat> I was reassigned then <clears throat> to uh, Air, Air Base down at Moultrie, Georgia, and uh, or just out of Moultrie. And so that's where I was when when it ended in in Europe. Uh, I mean, uh, in in Japan, it already had ended in Europe. But at the time we came back from overseas, mm -hmm. so I was overseas when it when it ended in 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 Europe. My father passed away about two weeks after I got out of service. So I was at home with my mother for a good long while in Elbert County. Then I went back to college and completed my college education. And then I went to work with a, with a well, first the public health uh, department in the state of Georgia, but then the United States Public Health Service. And I moved and worked all over the country. I was, I moved about 14 or 15 times before finally uh, coming to CDC as a deputy director of the Childhood Diseases Program. That, that was what I did here for the last 15 years, I guess, or thereabouts. <clears throat> From the old polio days to uh, measles, mumps, rubella, the whole bit. So, yeah, and I had a hundred plus individuals that I recruited and trained all over this country. So I had somebody in every state, in every major city in the country that I supervised. So I'm a member of my old full first bomb group and I'm on the board. I have been active with that for a number of years, for years. And, and of course, I belong, we have an 8th Air Force chapter right here in Atlanta and I'm active in that and have been for a number of years. Most people were like me I guess unless you were with someone else who who served with you or otherwise you didn't really say too much about it until years later really. Although I worked all over People knew, uh, people with whom I worked knew that I had been in the Air Force and so on, but we didn't talk about it. It broadened my outlook about a lot of things. You, you, you met different people, you knew about different things than you did growing up in, in, uh, in Georgia. Well, different levels of society and otherwise about uh, what goes on elsewhere, which I had no avenue to, you know, I had not been exposed to, if you will, except in a limited way in college, but I mean, that's that's far different than that kind of an experience. I think it creates somewhat more understanding of what went on, as I had described earlier. Uh, I had four of the brothers who served in, in the military as well, one of whom made it a career. The remainder of us did not. So uh, having had that kind of exposure, I guess, and because uh, one of my brothers, while I was in England, was in, he was in Italy in the 15th Air Force. I had another brother back in the States in the Air Force. Uh, so we had some things in common, if you will. And we talked about what went on, where, how. 
things that were different. They did things in the 15th Air Force because of the circumstances. Now, you're, you're different terrain and otherwise uh, than what you were doing in England, although you had some of the common goals. Uh, it certainly was just simply different. But it's one thing for sure. Uh, we had as many as 2,000 aircraft in the air in, in England during the war. The way aircraft are built now, you would never see that again, forever. Uh, two or three large aircraft now could almost do the kind of thing that several bomb groups could do at that time. So things are certainly different and progress differently. The need and, uh, and balance of manpower is vastly different. Uh, going to be more technology involved than, than perhaps with us. But I do try to appreciate the differences. During the time of World War II, it has been depicted as the greatest generation. And I'm proud, of course, to have been a part of that. Uh, whether or not there will ever be a, a duplicates of this, certainly no one knows.